Hello, everybody. Welcome to the GBV AOR Community of Practice and Help Desk webinar. Um, this is Sarah Martin. I am one of the Community of Practice moderators. And I just wanted to uh, welcome you all today and tell you a little bit more briefly about the GBV AOR response, uh, Area of Responsibility Community of Practice. So we're a virtual space for both new and experienced GBV specialists to interact with each other. It's a place online where you can discuss challenges and troubleshoot solutions that you're facing in your context. We currently have over 700 members worldwide in all of the different continents, and we um, share new resources like this new GPB IE Help Desk product that we're going to discuss today. So this webinar is a uh, jointly hosted by us and the Help Desk, um, and it will be recorded and shared on the GBB AOR website so you can um, access it at other times. So without further ado, um, I turn it over to Jean Ward. Thank you, Jean. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody who's listening in. It's great to have you um, be participating in this webinar. We're really excited to be able to share this guidance note, and we're also very exci excited that we have um, our colleagues from Indonesia um, who were featured in a case study in the guidance note. Our plan is that I'm going to introduce you to the guidance note uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're going to talk about the case study from Indonesia. And then we'll have a QA with Indonesia colleagues. Since we're re-recording this uh, webinar without participants, because we had some um, technical um, issues with the last recording, we won't have the QA with the webinar participants. Thanks, Sarah. Next slide. Okay, so Sarah already introduced herself. My name is Jean Ward. I work as a um, technical advisor to the GBVAOR Help Desk. I want to take this time to introduce you to two Indonesia colleagues who are on this call, Ibeth and Risia. Can you introduce yourselves? Hi, this is Risia. Good evening from Indonesia. Risia, can you just share with the um, with the call with colleagues who who are on the call what your role is at UNFPA? I'm a gender specialist for UNFPA Indonesia. Okay, super. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm humanitarian program coordinator in uh, UNFPA Indonesia. Great, Elizabeth, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, all right, and then we have some other um, colleagues who were on the first uh, webinar that we did um, uh, who weren't able to join us for this pre-recording. Um, but we want to just take this opportunity to thank them for their participation in the previous webinar. Sarah, next slide, please. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background to the guidance note that we're talking about today, the guidance note is a part of a series of knowledge products produced by the GBV Area of Responsibility Help Desk, which Sarah referred to. All of these products uh, that the Help Desk puts out are based on um, queries from members of the broader GBV community. It's a service uh, that the AOR provides and the services are free of charge. This note focuses on addressing GBV and natural disasters with special attention to emerging good practices and lessons learned from efforts to prevent and respond to GBV in the aftermath of recent natural disasters in the Asia and Pacific region. The topic of natural disasters was chosen based on recommend, recommendations by GBV AOR members Given the current extent of natural disasters and their anticipated increase in frequency and intensity as a result of climate change and other factors, and the impact natural disasters have on women and girls' safety and well being, it's critical that GBV actors be able to draw from emerging good practices and lessons learned when planning and implementing GBV programming in settings affected by climate related emergencies. 
the Asia Pacific region was identified as an area of particular focus for this guidance note, not only because it's the region most affected by natural disasters globally, but also because natural national governments and regional capacity in disaster management has grown significantly in the last decade, generating some really useful, interesting insights into the challenges and successes in addressing GBV before, during, and after a natural disaster. Uh, the information presented in the guidance note is meant to serve as an introduction to the topic. It's not an exhaustive overview. There's simply not yet enough published information or evidence about GBV programming in natural disasters to produce a definitive guide. Just for your information, some of the preliminary questions that the guidance note sought to address are, what distinguishes efforts to address GBV in natural disasters as compared to other humanitarian emergencies driven by conflict, for example? What is the evidence of good practices and lessons learned in prevention of and response to GBV, particularly in recent disasters in the Asia Pacific? What are the critical areas of focus or consideration in order to support effective GBV programming in natural disasters? And what are some of the considerations for GBV experts and other humanitarian actors to ensure improved action on GBV in natural disasters? So the note begins with a broad introduction and then examines more specifically the links between GBV and natural disasters, and then concludes with a few key takeaways for the GBV community aimed at improving efforts to address GBV in the context of natural disasters. Sarah, <coughs> next slide, please. Oops, previous slide. Okay. So the UN defines natural disasters as the consequences of events triggered by natural hazards that overwhelm local response capacity and seriously affect the social and economic development of a region. So this is important. To constitute a natural disaster, an incident or incidents must directly impact the safety, health, and well-being of humans. And to such extent, that governments and communities can't adequately meet the needs of those affected. Disasters that occur suddenly are often referred to as sudden onset and include, for example, earthquakes and tsunamis, as well as floods, cyclones, and volcanic eruptions. Disasters that evolve more gradually, such as in the case of droughts, are typically referred to as slow onset. Notably, these events, these natural events, constitute more than 90% of the world's disasters. Between 2014 and 2017, according to UNOCHA, disasters caused by natural hazards affected more than 187, 800, sorry, and 70 million people per year covering more than 100 countries and territories. In 2018 alone, natural disasters resulted in over 17 million new displacements. Okay, Sarah, next slide, please. Scientists predict that the frequency and devastation of natural disasters will continue to rise in line with the changing climate. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produced a report in late 2019 indicating that it's not likely that global warming of the Earth's average temperature can be held to or below 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial average temperatures. This means um, in layman's terms, that global warming is likely to exceed what is widely understood as the tipping point for massive climate catastrophes. Even without reaching this point, the climate cha changing climate is expected to continue to intensify the extent and severity of natural disasters. As concerning as this prognosis may be, 
climate change, and this is a, a very key point for all of us GBV actors, Climate change is not the only contributor to negative impacts of climate-induced emergencies on affected populations. In fact, a study that was released in 2015 examined the human cost of natural disasters over the period of 1994 to 2013, and it concluded that population growth and economic development are greater contributors to vulnerability than to climate change. So while disasters have become more frequent over the last 20 years, the average number of those affected has fallen from an average of one in 23 from 1994 to 2003 to an average of one in 39 during 2004 to 2013. But this, it, this is good news, but this good news is skewed to higher income countries. Even though higher income countries experienced more disasters overall from 2004 to 2013, as compared to lower income countries, they experienced less mortality related to the disasters. Researchers estimate that more than three times as many people died per disaster in lower income countries compared to high income countries. And when we take into account that poverty and lack of infrastructure as much risk factors for natural disasters as they are outcomes of disasters, it's easy to see why there's a strong overlay of displacement due to natural disasters with displacement due to conflict. Natural disasters can exacerbate conflicts while conflicts and fragility intensify the effects of natural disasters. So this has real implications, this link has real implications for GBV programmers working in uh, conflict affected settings. Okay, Sarah, next slide, please. So we, we're not going to go into this slide in detail, but as you can see, um, or what this slide is trying to represent, is the fact that Asia and Pacific is one of the world's, or is the world's most disaster prone region. It's vulnerable both to sudden and slow onset disasters, including earthquakes typhoons, cyclones, flooding, tsunamis, volcanoes, drought, and, and food-related food shortages. Um, some of the better known disasters from this region are the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004, Typhoon Nargis in 2008, there was a Japan earthquake in 2010, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines in 2013, from 2014 to 2017, the region experienced 55 earthquakes, 217 storms and cyclones, and 236 cases of severe flooding. As I was saying before, the very fact of the region's vulnerability has led national governments to prioritize investments in disaster management, making the region an important source of learning. In the last 10 years, most countries in the region have established national disaster management authorities and built national systems that are increasingly capable of managing small and medium scale disasters. Okay, Sarah, next slide, please. Across Asia and Pacific and in other emergencies worldwide, it's not unusual for women and girls to be more negatively affected by emergencies compared to men and boys. Social constructions of gender rather than biological differences determine this vulnerability. Findings suggest that particularly in countries with significant discrimination against women, women's mortality rates during disasters can be markedly higher. For example, an older but nevertheless often cited example because it's such a powerful um, piece of data is the 1991 cyclone in Bangladesh, where women were reportedly 14 times more likely to die than men. More recently, in a multi-country survey undertaken by women's rights organizations after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, the findings indicated Indonesia, India, and Sri Lanka had approximately eight out of 10 
deaths from the tsunami, which were female, 70% of the adults who died in the 2009 tsunami in Samoa and Tonga were female. By contrast, in settings where the economic and social status of women is relatively high, the mortality rate for men and women during and after disasters has been determined to be roughly the same. Another important point. Sarah, next slide, please. So although the evidence is limited, some of the gender discriminatory social norms that seem to consistently heighten vulnerability for women and girls include low economic and social status generally, limited mobility, including prohibitions against being in public that discourage women and girls from evacuating, or cumbersome clothes that undermine movement, limited access to transport, less access to skills development that would mitigate risks, such as being taught how to swim or climb trees, less physical strength, especially informed by nutritional deficiencies, caretaking and other domestic responsibilities that place women in homes that are poorly constructed and may also affect their opportunity to flee, illiteracy that prevents women from accessing or understanding early warning messaging systems that aren't targeted to them, and or engaging in decision-making or planning for preparedness, which is something we're gonna talk about in just a minute. And then finally, livelihood patterns that place women in, in situations of high risk. Women's increased risk during disasters is a reflection of their pre-existing status. Lack of education, lack of resources, productive work that is rendered invisible are just a few of the issues that define and reinforce their subordinate position in society and contribute to their risk of exposure to natural disasters. And it should be noted that there are specific groups of females who suffer double or triple risk from additional sources of marginalization, such as age, race, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, et cetera. And the same issues that make women more likely to be killed in disasters also make the aftermath for those who survive more challenging. Women and girls are often excluded from disaster response administrative systems and disaster risk management policies and procedures are often gender blind. Women and girls may face unequal access to aid, loss of documentation, inequities in property restitution, amongst many other gender-based challenges. In just one example, following the 2010 flooding in Pakistan, Financial and familial restrictions reduced women's mobility, which in turn affected their ability to access even the most basic aid, including water and sanitation facilities. In the case of the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, women were more dramatically affected by the emergency, but few were engaged in the management of the response. Sarah, next slide, please. So we're not going to look at this. I just asked you to read the um, slide. We're not going to look at this um, in great depth, but as noted um, previously, the um, Asian Pacific region has a high incident of natural disasters. However, there's a real dearth of sex and age desegregated data from post-disaster settings, not just the Asian, not just Asia and the Pacific, but elsewhere around the world, that makes it really hard to get a full a reliable picture of women and girls' experiences, included, including related to their exposure of violence. We have a small but growing body of evidence that indicates women and girls are exposed to multiple forms of GBV in the aftermath of natural disasters. Intimate partner violence is one example. Consistently across disasters where G GBV has been studied, intimate partner violence <laughs> is raised as one of the biggest concerns. Other issues are child marriage, sexual assault, sexual exploitation, and trafficking. Sarah, next slide, please. Yeah. 
So as is captured in the core global GBV guidance from the ISC GBV guidelines to the revised coordination handbook and in the GBV minimum standards, many of the responsibilities for addressing GBV in natural disasters are the same as in conflict affected settings. In all natural disasters, it's critical to apply guiding principles for safe and ethical survivor-centered and empowering programming. It's also important to assume that GBV is happening and not to wait for data before funding or initiating programming. Humanitarian actors have to come together to ensure a coordinated response that supports and maximizes the expertise of many different actors. And yet, however similar GBV responses in conflict-affected emergencies and natural disasters may be, there are some important differences that will inform the planning and scale of GBV programming. Lessons learned from Asia and the Pacific, as well as from other disaster settings around the world, illustrate some of these differences. Several examples, are, I'm gonna go through several examples, um, and I just wanna, re-emphasize that this list is neither exhaustive or universal, but it's just an, an attempt to try and capture some of the collective learning about characteristics that tend to distinguish natural disasters um, in order to improve understanding about implications for disaster-related GBV programming. Okay, so just a couple of additional key issues in disasters related to addressing GBV. And then we're going to go on to our case study for, uh, on, from Indonesia. So just a couple points. Responses to natural disasters. Sarah, can we just move back one side? Yeah, there we go. Responses to natural disasters, particularly in non-conflict settings, are increasingly managed by national governments and regional mechanisms. The international community may be called upon for discrete areas of support. As noted previously, Asia and the Pacific exemplify a trend in disaster management towards nationalization of response that is led by government, often in collaboration with the military, the civil society, and the private sector. Support for government-led responses is a critical aspect of localization in line with the objectives of the humanitarian action laid out in the grand bargain. This means, however, that success in the response is predicated on the leadership and capacity of nat national and local actors. So international humanitarian actors have a responsibility to support capacity building as part of preparedness planning. And this means that the GBV community must support ongoing improvements in GBV related systems for prevention, risk mitigation and survivor response. All right, second point, responses to natural disasters are informed by disaster risk reduction laws, policies and guidelines developed prior to the crisis. Successes in localization of response are often dependent on ensuring that attention to GBV is included in laws policies, and associated guidelines for disaster risk reduction. However, without entry points or regular opportunities to engage the government, influencing laws and policies can be challenging for GBV actors. And sometimes using the cluster system, even in settings where international actors are not necessarily leading the response can be a useful approach. In the Asia Pacific region, for example, Disaster risk reduction agendas increasingly promote gender inclusive approaches with some recognition of the need for gender sensitive disaster risk reduction initiatives. But attention to GBV is still weak. To address this problem, and as a first step, some countries with clusters have developed intersector contingency plans that include GBV and bring awareness about the standards for GBV response in the case of an emergency. In Vanuatu, for example, the establishment of the Gender and Protection Cluster following Cyclone Pam in, in 2015 strengthened the enabling environment and facilitated advocacy on attention to GBV in subsequent emergencies. So there's a lot of work to be done um, for preparedness with natural disasters. 
Another key point is that in countries with cyclical natural disasters, data is increasingly recognized as critical to informing preparedness and improving response. The growing focus on collecting population data for disaster preparedness provides an opportunity for GBV actors to promote understanding of and attention to GBV in preparedness and response. While the GBV guidelines underscore the point that GBV response in emergencies should not be contingent on data about the scope of the problem and that humanitarian responders have to assume that GBV is taking place, the development of GBV specific or GBV related data systems for disaster preparedness and response can nevertheless support advocacy efforts as well as improve targeting of at-risk women and girls. This means undertaking GBV assessment, situational analysis, and other research as part of preparedness to establish a baseline on the nature and scope of different forms of GBV, as well as services that are available to address GBV in the affected communities. All right, uh, Sarah, next slide, please. It's the last slide before we go on to our um, Sulawesi example. So, Another point, natural disasters may result in widespread damage to infrastructure, particularly in the hardest hit areas. This has implications for formulating response to GBV. The fact of widespread destru destruction often calls for approaches that engage actors outside the affected region who can be deployed for rapid response. Governments in Asia Pacific may rely on the military as a key first responder. In relation to GBV programming, engaging actors outside the affected region may mean supporting women's groups and organizations to undertake mobile response. In the Philippines, UNFPA has trained a local pool of nat national, national people who can be recruited for GBV roles in crisis. Another key point, the response may be shorter with the transition to recovery faster than in conflict affected settings. And in too many settings, recovery tends to focus on infrastructure, often leaving out issues of women's rights, gender-based violence, and gender equality in recovery frameworks. But we know, as GBV experts, that the global evidence tells us that recovery and resilience is linked to advancements in gender equality and associated reductions in gender-based violence. So this calls upon the GBV actors to actively engage around the development of recovery frameworks if the recovery is to be sustainable, whether as part of the national um, recovery planning process or as part of the GBV coordination partner strategic planning. And then the last point about key issues in disasters related to addressing GBV is that funding mechanisms may be different for natural disasters and conflict settings. The Asia Pacific is a good example of how funding for disaster response can be different from conflict settings. Not only does funding for disaster relief tend to run on shorter cycles, it's coming less and less from global humanitarian funding streams. With governments exercising more control over management of resources, there may be increased reliance on direct bilateral funding to the governments of affected regions. This means that the humanitarian GBV community must be aware of and familiar with alternative funding streams. We have to understand that the shifts in funding may be, mean less money is flowing to local NGOs, which can have an impact on availability of services. As well, it's important when we're designing GBV programs to anticipate the likelihood of transitioning relatively quickly back to development funds after the initial stages of disaster and pl plan accordingly. One example of a strategy that incorporates this reality is helping local women's organizations who are new to GBV work sustain their programs by providing training about how to access development funding when emergency monies dry up. So those are just a few key issues. As I said, they're not exhaustive. Um, they're just to help us begin to think um, with greater clarity uh, about what some of the distinct differences are um, between addressing GBV and natural disasters 
and addressing GBV in the conflict affected settings in which we work. Now I'd like to turn us to our colleagues um, from Indonesia for a case study on the GBV response in Central Sulawesi. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, my colleague Elizabeth and I will share on our intervention and lessons learned from Central Sulawesi. Next, please. Uh, the intervention is in the aftermath of 28 September 2018 uh, disasters when the Central Sulawesi they experienced an earthquake, tsunami, and then liquefaction. Around 30, uh, 3,000 uh, lives lost and 170,000 people forced to flee. And the uh, district of Palu, Sigi, and Donggala uh, were the most affected areas uh, impacted by these disasters. Before we go to the next slide, I would like to also give you the background on uh, how the GBV case management in Indonesia. Actually, in 2010, the government established what they call it a government integrated multi-sectoral services for GBV. Uh, GBV, it's uh, for women and children uh, violence, uh, uh, victims of violence. So uh, this is uh, the coordination mechanism function, uh, one stop service, not one stop services, but uh, this is like integrated services. It's established at the provincial and district level, but it's not at the community based level. So during the disaster, next please. We map uh, whether the, the integrated services function well, and then we also map the, uh, the partner. And then once we identify partner, when we, we map the services, then we start to strengthen a coordination uh, function. We uh, establish, we function the GBVIE subcluster at the subnational level. And then we establish uh, 12 women-friendly spaces at uh, the most impacted area. Usually, we, dis uh, we consult with the government be before we establish this, uh, this, uh, this uh, women-friendly spaces. And then usually, it's it, it close to the, our RH10. So we aim to have this gender sector and then also the RH sector uh, work closely uh, in terms of uh, gender issues. Then we implement GBV SRH linkages program. Uh, Women-friendly spaces function as the first community level uh, entry point for any uh, issues related to uh, women. They could uh, come as a GBV victims. They could also come as uh, if they have a problem with uh, RH uh, uh, issues. So we could refer them to RH10. The same thing as the RH, uh, RH10, uh, while uh, we also uh, manage to uh, provide some, uh, some kind of uh, basic uh, training for the midwives and health sector to respond to, to refer to the women friendly spaces once they identified there is an uh, they identified that there is a potential uh, GBV case in in uh, with their client we strengthen the multi sectoral GBV prevention and response policies and program uh, so uh, in this situation we uh, the government realized we we uh, the women friendly spaces function as the government uh, government uh, what they call it what government support at the community level so this will be really helpful yeah when once we have the case to uh, women friendly spaces it really easy for us uh, for for the government to then for the women friendly spaces to then refer the case to the existing government multi-sectoral services. So we strengthen the capacity of the women-friendly spaces in GBV case management, and then we also strengthen the government 
the existing government multi-sectoral services. And then we develop advocacy materials to respond to GBV in emergency through the GBV in emergency subcluster at the subnational level. We managed to develop uh, what we call it the recommendation how to integrate, how to mainstream GBV into other clusters. Luckily, in Central Sulawesi, uh, actually prior to Central Sulawesi, a month prior to Central Sulawesi, we have Lombok earthquake, but the GBV, uh, the, the cluster, clustering mechanism was not uh, working well there, but in Central Sulawesi, yes. So we, uh, we developed uh, the recommendation on how to uh, integrate GBV into each eight sectors, other eight sectors. So uh, next please, lessons learned from Central Sulawesi. We uh, learn from three things, yeah, three of our inter uh, intervention. Three important things, advocacy and coordination, localization and life-saving intervention. From advocacy and coordination, uh, it uh, proved that GBV subcluster is uh, working well in coordinating all the effort managed by not only by uh, UNFPA yeah, but other international organization and then other other uh, other uh, CSO in response to GBV. So uh, this uh, GBV subcluster really uh, support the government in coordinating the GBV response. At in Central Sulawesi, policy and guidelines. So, with the GBV subcluster, with our intervention, we manage to provide uh, uh, input to the government uh, national master plan for Central Sulawesi, especially for uh, GBV uh, issues. Yeah, then. With that master plan, the government, local government, manage uh, to, to use that uh, master plan as an umbrella to develop some uh, local uh, regulation to support our program. I noticed that we, uh, I noticed that we have uh, uh, governor's decree on the establishment of the GBV subcluster, and then we have local regulation on uh, women's rights protection, uh, including GBV. And then the, through the GBV subcluster, and then through UNFPA intervention, with the absence of our partner from uh, uh, UN Women, we also managed to uh, train, because in Indonesia, actually, we have the program with what we call it uh, gender responsive planning and budgeting. So uh, with our intervention, we uh, managed to train the government and then the planners to uh, integrate GBV, gender and GBV into their rehabilitation and reconstruction uh, document and then also into their five years midterm development planning. This is a part of our exit strategy plan and sustainability because with that uh, integration, uh, we ensure that uh, gender and GBV will be, uh, will be integrated into the next five years planning. And also on the rehabilitation and the uh, rehabilitation, re rehabilitation and re re reconstruction process. On the localization, uh, we are so lucky because we have a very committed government through the GBV subcluster, this is really increased the government commitment. And then we are lucky that we are working with women's led uh, NGOs. Uh, Central Sulawesi used to be the area of conflict, so they have very strong women's led organization. We work with the uh, two very strong women's led organization. They also uh, act, they also play important roles in the function of GBV subcluster. And then institutional capacity building. The intervention also uh, built the capacity, not only the government, but also the local, uh, local women-led NGOs. We provide the capacity building based on their need. Uh, and then also uh, the intervention itself uh, built their own capacity on how to uh, work in these issues. Yeah. And then uh, champion, yeah, we have uh, some, even from the government, women champion, girl, re re religious leaders, and men. And then uh, 
we also managed to have a champion uh, from the government uh, for male involvement program yeah the government requests us to also provide the intervention on uh, male involvement for the planners and then for the religious religious leaders from there we uh, uh, we have the the champion from our program life saving intervention government realized uh, that uh, women friendly spaces and our other program is really life saving intervention especially our dignity kit we managed to uh, uh, through women friendly spaces we provide the uh, we distribute dignity kits adolescent kit elderly kits and then uh, care for caregivers this uh, we realized that uh, women friendly spaces running all by the volunteers and then 90% of our volunteers are either victim of violence or victims of the, the the disasters so we provide care for caregivers to ensure that they will uh, uh, they will be uh, they will could uh, they will uh, heal and then they could run the uh, women friendly spaces they could also support others and then uh, we managed to have uh, as i mentioned uh, earlier between srh and gbv referral mechanism we refer to each other and then CMR inclusion in health services. Actually, Central Sulawesi is the first place when the Ministry of Health uh, launched the first uh, training on clinical management of rape survivors for not only health services but also for the uh, for the gender activists. So this is really help to link between the SRH and GBV uh, sector. Next, please. From our lessons learned, then uh, we can uh, see we still have many uh, uh, homework, some recommendation that we expect from for the next uh, intervention. First, policy and SOP adaptation. Because we develop so many uh, uh, policy and OSP, SOP adaptation, we really expect that the SOP, the SOP will be adapted uh, once uh, we have uh, another disaster at another area. We aim to have the standardized uh, response by the government. Therefore, we need uh, to strengthen the role of national government to lead subcluster for sustainability. This is our big, big uh, homework uh, in the uh, in the future. Ibet, Ibet can uh, tell more about this. And GBVSRH, the RR plans to be adopted nationally at that subnationally. Subnationally, we learn from Central Sulawesi. We would like to have this at national level and then other subnational level. Ensuring minimum services on the community level, strengthen the capacity of women-led NGOs. I think that's all from our uh, experience in Central Sulawesi. Uh, over to you, Jean. Thanks so much, Risia. So interesting. And thank you to, um, to all of your hard work during that emergency. Just have a few questions that I, that I wanted to ask you that I feel um, participants listening um, to your presentation may also have, and that also link to some of the key points in the guidance note. My first question is about localization and government commitment. You mentioned that the response and recovery effort towards Central Sulawesi has been led by the national and subnational governments with support from UNFPA. Through the research for the guidance note, we noticed this trend for localization of the disaster response, that the national government is playing a larger role during national disaster responses in Asia and the Pacific region. I wonder if you could provide just a little bit more detail about how UNFPA um, did the, conducted the advocacy to engage the government to establish the GBV mechanism during disaster preparedness and what kind of support was provided by UNFPA to ensure a swift response to the disaster um, by the, the government and local partners in Central Sulawesi. I give this to Ibet since Ibet dealing with all the advocacy and coordination mechanism. Ibet, over to you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Maria. Yes, um, 
This is the quite difficult part for advocacy to start the advocacy with the Minister of Women Empowerment. Uh, UNEPA Indonesia have started introduce the uh, maybe some of you have aware about the minimum minister service package. Uh, we introduced this since 2003 in Indonesia and has been adopted by government of Indonesia in 2008. Um, learning from this, uh, finally at 2018, it has been uh, endorsed in, in, the, in the national guideline on the minimum initial service package operational guideline that adopted by government of Indonesia and introduces national wide. Learning from the, our experiences with the Ministry of Health as the leading sector for the reproductive sector, we engage uh, the Ministry of Women Empowerment by establishment the LGBT subcluster coordinations, which is started in 2017. So with a strong support and technical assistance from uh, UNFPA, uh, we introduced the minimum uh, services indicators uh, to the, in 2008. And then uh, develop the, the guideline on the protections of women and children's rights from the GBV uh, for, during the humanitarian situations. Uh, we set up several discussions with the, at national level with Ministry of Women Empowerment and then support them as the uh, leading sector coordinator for the subclusters, which is co-coordinated by Ministry of Social Affairs because of the, we know that some of uh, limitation of the capacity, but uh, with strong support uh, by UNAPA. So in 2008, we agree on the agreed term of reverence of this subcluster. Uh, this is very new, and then suddenly there is um, uh, there was an earthquake in uh, in TB in Lombok, and then continue with the Central Sulawesi. So uh, by activating these uh, clusters, but uh, the the point for Central Sulawesi is uh, the commitment from uh, the uh, protection uh, the. Provincial Women Empowerment and Child Protections, which is under the Ministry of Women Empowerment. So it's very, uh, it's really support our uh, localizations and then the coordination as well, the advocacy to introduce the national uh, term of reference of the GBV subclusters and then adopt it at provincial level. And then it, it was adopted by the governor decree during that time, which is the clusters, the GBV subclusters at provincial level is still working until now after the post uh, disaster and they meet regularly funded by the local government. So um, we introduced the guideline first and then TOR agreed and then we engage with the several capacity and then involvement by the ministerial level until the subnational level, uh, including uh, during the responses. So they, they, they have the ownership with this program and they'll be the clusters and then they have the ownership to lead these subclusters. That's the first beginning. And the second one, uh, the localization, that which is crucial, is about the involvement of the community level uh, organizations, which is uh, women-led NGOs that's explained by Ria Kori, uh, how to link between the, the program at the government with the community level. Uh, we selected the, the, the committed women-led NGOs uh, in Central Sulawesi who has uh, acknowledged by the community, who has the experiences as well in the community base of GBV referral mechanisms. So we empower them at focus, uh, creating awareness during, uh, from the volunteers and then link, introduce and ask them to be more active during the GBV provincial subclusters. So that's the, the process between uh, one year in Central Sulawesi Jin and then uh, and the meetings, coordination is still going until now. Uh, by the time the cases of GBV is uh, uh, increasing, the cases of the child marriage are increasing, so they, they, they have the relations between the NGOs, other members, and also government, including the multi-sectoral services, uh, to discuss how to have the GBV referral mechanisms better, how to have the coordinations better. So that's the, wow. the way. Uh, we work uh, during the localization from the government commitment and then government uh, women that the NGOs. Um, it's just so impressive. I mean, I think there are a number of important points that you're raising um, through your discussion about localization and and engaging with the government. And and one is the value of. Um, establishing a coordination mechanism even prior to the emergency. Um, 
so that you can do advocacy and really um, be better organized to mobilize response. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about community engagement. In your presentation, you explained that the role of the community is, is crucial for social awareness, for behavior change, and for GBV prevention. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the role of women-led NGOs or other stakeholders you observed and relied on um, during the response, and how UNFPA ensured that the voice of the community, especially voices of women and girls, would be heard, and how were, how were women involved in the process of program implementation? I can answer this first, maybe Maria can uh, edit later. Um, UNEPA is uh, one of the active member uh, in the community engagement working group uh, during Central Sulawesi Humanitarian Response. This working group led by IFRC, uh, which is just initially um, functioned during Central Sulawesi uh, Humanitarian Response. So uh, there are there were several uh, focus group discussions we facilitated uh, for women for the affected women as well for the adolescent girl as well for the elderly or the older persons on the, their their opinion about the aid humanitarian aid or the shelter design uh, and then we also uh, facilitated the research on the adolescent girls and youth in crisis situations to hear the voice for the uh, voices for the girls on their vulnerability and resilience so through these focus group discussions, we are not ended at this part only, but uh, we know the, their voices. So uh, UNAPA is very active uh, until now uh, through the subclusters, uh, as well in the protection uh, national clusters, uh, both at the national and subnational level. So uh, by having these voices from elderly, from adolescents, girls, for women, we uh, analyze this and then bring those voices through the subclusters meetings, and then we raise the concerns. So we able to um, formulate the, the opinion from the elderly women, adolescents, girls on the shelter design through the uh, shelter subclusters discussions. And then the shelter, shelter design uh, endorsed by the government of the provincial Central Sulawesi where all the inputs from the uh, women, including girls and, and the elderly, is included or is also included in those uh, design, which, which is um, also the, took the priority by the uh, lead sector of the protection cluster during that time. And the other one from the voices from adolescents, uh, we able to do the technical discuss, uh, discussion, which is led by the regional secretariat during that time. And this technical discussion, we 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 able to to identify what is the vulnerability, what is the resilience, and how to integrate that into the local government plans. So the government secretary at the province during that time shared this to the head of the cities and districts to include those uh, action uh, action plans into their their plans. So the other the other community engagements that we've done is through the reproductive health plans, which is uh, women pregnant affected women. We gathered their inputs uh, through, we used that the suggesting box during that time. So how to improve our services to the, to the community. So that's the way the community engagements to um, having those voices through the community engagement and then uh, bring those voices through the meetings into the actions. Uh, maybe for the women-led NGOs, maybe Maria, you can add more on this. Yes, uh, in the design of our program in Central Sulawesi, actually the two women-led NGOs acting as the, uh, well, how when can we do it? It's a facilitator yeah, for the community because when uh, we established, they, they, they managed to establish women-friendly spaces, but once they establish women-friendly spaces, they will identify the community, women community member to act as the, uh, to act to manage the, the women friendly spaces itself so they facilitate themselves uh, with the community they raise their concern in in, in uh, fgd at women friendly spaces then uh, the women led ngo will facilitate their voice and then uh, bring their voice during the gbvi subcluster uh, 
So this is uh, the way we work on, uh, on addressing the issue at the community level. Thank you. Okay, great. Very interesting. I just, in the interest of time, I just want to ask one more question. You had talked about this, um, you had talked about this in your, the, 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 um, your feedback around localization and engagement of the government, but I wanted to follow up on it because it's such an important, such an important issue, whether we're working in, um, in conflict affected settings or natural disasters, the issue of sustainability of GBV response. But sometimes it's more challenging in natural disasters because the, um, the transition from disaster response back to sort of the development norm is so much faster. So you shared with us how you strengthen collaboration and referral pathways for the GBV survivors in Central Sulawesi. Um, and as often the case, after disaster recovery, some of the GBV work is discontinued due to a lack of funding or other issues. Um, I wonder what kind of support UNF provi UNFPA provided, or if you could say more about the support UNFPA provided so that the collaboration and the referral pathways um, continue to be available for uh, the survivors in Central Sulawesi. So, uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, we trained both yeah, the government and then the community on uh, GBV case management. And this is uh, the referral pathway is actually integrated into government, finally integrated into government uh, local, uh, uh, local regulation. Uh, uh, so we ensure the sustainability because once it's in the document, it will be uh, it will be covered by the local budget. In another way, actually, women friendly spaces now is not acting as uh, uh, only uh, GBV issues because we train people, we train women in the local area. They have a program what, what they call it. Uh, village fund program so this is uh, the place for the forum for uh, the women fr uh, women friendly spaces now act as a forum for women to raise their concern and then also actively participate in the village program because the village program also have a village fund uh, support by the local government village government this is the way we try to sustain. So this is not only limited to GBV issues, but also limited to other issues concerned by women in that community level. Super, okay, thanks so much for that. Okay, our colleagues from Indonesia, any other final points that you wanna add about your experiences, uh, your experience in um, prevention of and response to GBV in Central Sulawesi? Yeah, maybe I would like to add uh, a little bit about the, the yeah you mentioned it already uh, as well, Jean. That uh, sometimes, not sometimes, but often that uh, during the humanitarian situations, it is the opportunity for UNFPA to introduce the new things, which is the like integration of the GBV into their plans. So uh, that's why the importance of good preparations and coordinations uh, at the central level with the readiness of the SOPs. Or our guidelines, related guidelines, or the very reader, reader friendly and very practical things that we can bring uh, to the subnational level and humanitarian responses is really uh, important to prepare in advance. So when humanitarian occurs, we just uh, train like a um, source or some people that need to be deployed uh, or the volunteers that need to be deployed to to have the operations and then settle all of the things for the advocacy part. I think advocacy can be done since the humanitarian responses during the coordinations and when the government buy in that's the time that we um, ask them to like uh, form up during like uh, using the government decree or such certain decree to formalize this kind of coordination mechanism for GBV. So we can start it introduced not only for the humanitarian situations, but the GBV coordinations, support coordination can be also, uh, can be maintained using the local budget uh, in the normal situation later on. So yeah, we introduce something during the humanitarian response, but try to link that to their, their government's uh, mechanisms. That's, we call it as a localizations uh, as well. Uh, Great, thank you so much. 
Well, thanks to our Indonesia colleagues and thank you, um, Sarah. I will let you um, I will let you end our presentation today. Okay, thank you so much, Jean, and thank you, colleagues from Indonesia. That was super fascinating. Um, I just want to remind all the listeners um, that you can always reach out to our GBVIE help desk if you have a question. They're available to you to provide free confidential care. And um, they have a, a global roster of GBV experts who are ready to provide the support to you. Um, and if you are a GBV uh, specialist or somebody working in G GBV who would like to get more information and know more about it and want to join us on our community of practice, you can always send us an email at gbvcop at gmail.com and we can help you join the, the group and we'd love to have you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and we wish you all a safe and healthy life. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah. All right, you guys. Great job.